All right, so today we're gonna to be looking at the very common web crawler system design interview question. So basically a web crawler, also known as a spider bot, spider, is a type of bot that is used to systematically browse the web. Uh, and so it's common use cases, you know, indexing for search engines, so Google, Bing, Yahoo. What these crawlers will do is they'll scan and index web pages so that they can then provide relevant search results for users. It's also used in data mining, um, and this can be used for many reasons, for market analysis, competitive analysis, uh, research, uh, and then it similarly can be used for archiving. You know, a classic example there would be the, the uh, Wayback Machine, uh, where you can see snapshots of websites from, you know, different dates in the past. Okay, so looking at the requirements for this system design, we've got our functional requirements. Uh, and so in this case, when we're given seed URLs, what we have to do is then crawl related pages. And then we also have to ensure that we ignore duplicate pages. And then for the non-functional requirements, we want the ability to prioritize URLs. And then we also want to be polite. So essentially politeness here refers to the fact that we don't want to overload sites that we're crawling we want to make sure that when we make requests to that to get information that we do so in a spaced out and timely manner such that we don't overload uh, their system and then for the estimates so these are just questions we kind of want to get an answer from our our interviewer from so that we can better construct um, our system so the first question i'd always ask would be you know what type of content will we be storing uh, and so in this case we're going to be storing html but then the system should be extendable such that we can store other forms of content and we'll be looking at that in the uh, system architecture then i'd look at how many pages will we need to crawl each month so in this example we're going to be looking at storing roughly 1 billion 10 to the power of 9 pages per month uh, and so now that we know this we can do some rough estimates on a kind of storage capacity so if we know the average page size nowadays is between you know two and three megabytes if we say roughly it's two and a half megabytes uh, we then can do some quick calculations say so our monthly storage is going to be 10 to the power of 9 so 1 billion pages multiplied by 2.5 by 10 to the 6 so that's 2.5 megabytes uh, per page multiply those uh, if you remember your exponents we know we've got 2.5 times you know 10 to the power of 9 times 10 to the power of 6 we can just add the exponents which will give us 9 plus 6 15 so we've got 2.5 by 10 to the power of 15 bytes. So that's our monthly storage requirements. And then for yearly, we just multiply this number, that number by 12. Uh, 12 times 2.5 is 30. So therefore, again, using our exponents, we can move one over. So we get 15 gets bumped to 16, and then it's just three by 10 to the 16 bytes. And then if we assume we're storing for five years, multiply that by five, and then we've got 15 and similarly move it across. We've got 1.5 by 10 to the 17 bytes. And then to convert that to petabytes, so one petabyte is equal to 1024 to the power of five bytes. Just simply divide those numbers and we've got 133 petabytes. So this is a lot of data uh, that we've got to store. And so we've got to take that into consideration when we're, uh, when we're looking at our uh, architecture. So jumping into our architecture, we've got our seed URLs. And so the seed URLs are the initial URLs that we've chosen from which to start crawling. Uh, and again, which URLs you choose kind of depends on your use case. So for example, you could use high level directories like Wikipedia, government websites, um, but you could also use news aggregators like RSS feeds or social media platforms. Uh, so it all depends on kind of what your use case is. So the URL frontier is one of the kind of the most important parts of this web crawler and we'll be diving deeper into it later. But essentially for right now, it's it, we're gonna know that it, it ensures politeness and prioritization. And it's also implements kind of a breadth first search approach. So if we you know look at the web as a directed graph where the web pages serve as nodes and the hyperlinks of the URLs as edges, um, when we're looking at it in that regard, depth first search isn't typically the best way to go because of the depth we can go super deep uh, when we're crawling pages. And so typically a breadth first search uh, is commonly used by web crawlers here and it's implemented with uh, FIFO queue, so first in, first out. But we'll be jumping uh, deeper into that later. Then we've got our HTML fetcher and renderer thread. So we've horizontally scaled this to kind of handle the, the kind of the magnitude of scale we'll be dealing with. And so what this will do is it'll firstly reach out to a custom DNS resolver, uh, which is implemented to convert our, obviously our domain into an IP address. And the reason we've gone with the custom approach here is we kind of want to avoid the expensive DNS resolution process. And we also might want to implement some caching here so that for some common uh, URLs we see, we cache that so it's, it's really fast. And then once it's got the IP address, it can then reach out to the internet and get that uh, that page. The next step then is the HTML parser. And so basically the HTML parser kind of does what it do says it does. It parses the HTML and it can also check for malformed 
uh, HTML and here uh, rather than just discarding malformed uh, content we could have some formatic logic which could attempt to resolve you know common HTML issues like missing ending tags and whatnot and so again we're just improving the kind of robustness uh, of our system then the next step then is to do some duplicate detection so obviously there's a lot of duplicate information on the on the on the web so well, we're going to need some way of detecting this and, and one way of doing that is using you know something like md5 hashing function uh, which is used to create a, a unique fingerprint uh, of a digital file or a message and, and so what it will do is it will take an input of arbitrary uh, of any arbitrary length so in this case that will be our html file and it produces a fixed length output which will be 128 bits represented as a 32 uh, hexadecimal characters uh, and so basically that will just serve as a compressed representation of the original file and so the pros of this is it's it's fast it's efficient and it's very scalable however the you know downside is it ignores minor changes which you know means we might miss near duplicates and there could be some potential collisions however those downsides don't really outweigh uh, the pros so I would definitely kind of try and implement MD5 hashing in this system uh, and then for the the actual caching um, I think a bloom filter is a very good option here. So a, a bloom filter is, you know, a probabilistic data structure. It's very space efficient and fast. Uh, I'm not going to go deep on it here, but it's a great option. Um, and we could use tools like Redis Bloom and Mempa Memcache to uh, actually implement it. And then for the actual content storage itself, you know, we could use a column oriented database like Cassandra, which supports indexing and filtering is good for frequent, frequent updates. However, it mightn't be optimal for this kind of data. Uh, and so you might alternately look at a distributed file system um, like HDFS, Google Cloud Storage, or like Amazon S3. Um, and, you know, the benefits of these are they're highly scalable, cost effective, um, and good for static data. But the cons are they might uh, may not be as efficient for you know frequent queries and you know it does require sometimes expertise in distributed systems and yeah so the choice is up to you which would you would use but typically s3 is a pretty safe approach and many people would use that and then the next step in the system will be the url extractor and so the url extractor is, is very simple it'll just extract links from the pages so that we can continue to to crawl and the system can continue to di discover new content however i previously said that we want this system to be extendable to look at other forms of content and so instead of sending it straight to the url extractor we could uh, send it to a uh, kafka and so basically kafka is just an open source distributed streaming platform and it's really good for handling high volumes of real-time data and it comes up again and again in so many system uh, design interview questions and so really uh, is really worthwhile going deep on so basically instead of sending it straight to the url extractor we give it to kafka uh, which will then push it to our modular services and this is basically uh, how we can just keep ad adding different services so in this case instead of ha having just the url URL extractor, we can also have the image download, an analytics service, and we can keep extending this uh, as much as we want. And so what this does is it makes our system uh, very extendable, which is obviously something uh, we'd want. So once we've extracted our URLs, we then look at the URL filter. And this kind of does exactly what it says. It filters the URLs based on some predefined, predefined rules, you know, which can help prevent certain sites, whether it be adult sites, malicious sites, uh, as well as like malformed URLs. And so by doing this, we can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our system by reducing the amount of irrelevant content uh, collected. Then we'll move on to our URL scene detector. And here we basically will just check uh, if we've seen uh, the URL before adding it back to the URL frontier. And then this, this in turn prevents kind of infinite loops within the system where we keep crawling, uh, recrawling the same site over and over again. And again, I, I think a bloom filter or maybe hash tables could be used uh, and either are kind of an okay approach for, for checking that. And then for the URL storage, uh, yeah, again, we're just storing URLs that we've pre previously visited. And I think maybe like a NoSQL column oriented database like Cassandra, which generally has faster reads than relational database and it's highly scalable. Um, I think this is a pretty good option here. And then lastly, those URLs uh, that haven't been seen are then sent back onto the URL frontier um, for crawling. Okay, so now that we've looked at the system architecture, we now want to look at the URL frontier in depth. So if you remember from our requirements, we want to be able to prioritize URLs and also ensure politeness. So basically what we've got here is we've got the front queue prioritizer. And so what is it does is it takes URLs and computes their priority. Uh, and so we could have a mapping table that could store some rules. So this could be based on, you know, update frequency, page rank, traffic, that could then determine the uh, priority. Um, of each uh, URL. And so then depending on its priority, we could put it in a queue. So in this example, we could say Q1 has the highest priority, Q2 is second highest, and then all the way down to QN, which is uh, which has the lowest priority. 
And so then within the front queue selector, what we'll do then is we will randomly choose URLs from each queue. However, we will bias it towards queues with a higher probability. And so therefore in that way, um, URLs with a higher probability uh, with a higher priority are then chosen more frequently and thus we've introduced um, priority within our system which is what this whole kind of front queue concept is about it's about priori prioritizing uh, whatever we deem to be more important URLs and then we'll also add in kind of a back queue system and again the whole uh, point of the back queue system is to implement politeness and so what we'll get here is the back queue selector we'll take the URLs and it will put them in different queues so each queue will only ever have one domain name so if we look at this queue b1 here that could have wikipedia.com and it will never have any other domain names within that queue so it'll only be wikipedia related ones and so what that allows us to do is in the back queue selector is it means when we select from uh, the b1 queue we can then add a delay and therefore we know that we are being polite that we're not bombarding um, Wikipedia in this case with excessive requests and potentially getting rate limited and whatnot and so that's how we can ensure politeness within our system such that we're not uh, bombarding sites with too many requests and then finally once that URL is selected we can send it off to the HTML fetcher and render which you know we've horizontally scaled to to handle the the load and then we can also use consistent hashing potentially to distribute uh, the requests uh, among those servers Okay, so now that we've gone over everything, let's just do a quick walkthrough and it should all make sense. So we've got our seed URL, so these are the URLs we've chosen with which we wanna start our crawl on. Then uh, the URL frontier, which we've just discussed, will then select the URLs to be crawled. Uh, well then the HTML fetcher will then fetch the URL from the URL frontier. It'll then resolve uh, use a DNS resolver to get the IP address and then it'll uh, fetch that, that content then from the internet. Then in the HTML parser, we will parse the, the content or we'll also try and reformat any um, mal malformed content. Uh, and then in the duplicate detection, very simply, we're going to check for duplicates. But here again, remember uh, the, the mechanism with which we do the detection as well as the caching and content storage is a is, is very important uh, topic to talk about. Uh, and then we've also got our modular services so we can pass content to all the related services. Uh, then we've got the URL filter. So when we want to filter out unwanted URLs, and then we have the URL scene detector, which again, checks if we've seen this URL or not. And then if we haven't seen it, we put it on the URL frontier so then it can then uh, subsequently be crawled. Okay, so then if we also look at some potential additional talking points, we could talk about server-side rendering. So we know, uh, you know many sites will use server-side rendering. Uh, so therefore, if we download and parse pages directly, you know, we mightn't be able to retrieve the dynamically generated links. And so to resolve this, we could perform server-side rendering uh, before parsing a page. We've also discussed, you know, horizontal scaling. Uh, and this is important to be able to handle the load we're going to be dealing with. And then as well, we've got the content storage and caching. So we've discussed di distributed file systems, no SQL database here. The key thing there is to discuss the pros and cons of each approach. And it's a great way to kind of show off your, your depth of knowledge. And then also the caching mechanism. So being able to dis uh, explain how Bloom filters work under the hood might be a you know, massive benefit in the interview. And then also additional services here. So we've shown how our system is modular and we can keep adding them so on. So again, we might want an analytic service. We also might want uh, you know, an image downloader. So if you think about additional services you could add to again, just make our system uh, you know, more robust and ultimately a, a better web crawler. Okay, so I hope this video helps clear things up. If it did, please you know, share with your friends, like, comment, subscribe. Um, you know, a lot of effort goes into the making of these videos and it helps out a lot. Uh, and I will see you in the next one.